Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Medical Center, our University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dahl Simons Family Studio and delighted to be back with you on this chilly and snow-dusted Tuesday morning here in January as it mm -hmm. winds down. Mm -hmm. We are joined in the studio, of course, by the ever-present and ever-faithful Doc Hawk, who is about to receive a special gift today. We'll see what happens in just a moment. And as well by Lee Norman, the Secretary of Kansas Department of Health and Education, Environment, Health and Environment, KDHE. And uh, we'll be turning to him in just a minute for his questions uh, and to talk with him a little bit. But first, Hawkeye, mm -hmm. how are things out yeah. there? What's yeah. going on? Stable, stable, which is good. Uh, certainly would like less, but we aren't seeing a huge increase, and we're kind of still on that plateau. We have 63 active infections with 16 in the ICU and 11 of those on the vent. We still do have 57 patients in the hospital in that recovery stage, so also with seven of those that remain on the vent. So long, long time for some of these patients to remain on the ventilator. So 120 total patients or, or beds that are taken up by COVID. Um, Hayes uh, is doing a little bit better, 20 total, but only 13 of those are active, so that's good, and seven in that recovery period as well. So I think we have, and we have seen this the last couple of weeks, really reached kind of that plateau, uh, which we can handle as far as capacity and, and critical and vital drugs and staffing. Uh, but certainly, as we continue to see that seven-day rolling average of cases in the metro area go down, hopefully our active cases in the hospital will go yeah, down. Yeah, it's really well. gone down in the yeah. Kansas City metro. I mean, I just, we've said before, BKC yep. and BKC yeah. should be proud KC mm -hmm. right now because we so. are seeing fewer new cases. Now, the testing numbers may be not as yeah. uh, robust, but, but I think that just reflects either people are getting a little complacent or mm -hmm. we just don't see as much illness. And I think that's, you know, we our census follows by about two weeks, whatever the testing day is yeah. in Kansas City. And so are in the metropolitan area. And what we're seeing is that our census is pretty stable stable right now. It's still really high. I mean, we still yeah. have 100 and whatever yeah, patients absolutely. with it. And that's still a big number, but it's still high. Okay, Hawkeye. Yeah. It's a big day for you. I know. What happens to you today is Hawkeye gets a booster shot mm -hmm. of the coronavirus yeah. vaccine, and that's going to be administered by Adam Meyer, mm -hmm. one of our outstanding directors of nursing for our ambulatory team. So Adam and Hawkeye, I think it's time It's time to, let's see, you You know, show some guns here. Buddy. All right, well... Here it goes. And I'm, Good morning. I'm on service seeing patients today in the hospital, too. So. All right. Now, did you pre-treat with a little Tylenol or I Motrin didn't. or anything? And I didn't last okay. time, so I'm expecting a little bit of shoulder discomfort for the yeah. next 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, but it should be better after that. So I pre-treat. I know you're not really supposed to, but I figure, gosh darn it. I think it's okay. I don't think it really changes your immunogenicity no, to take a little Motrin, so. and it helps me. But I liked it. Okay, all right, Adam, what do we have to talk to this guy about? Absolutely. So how are you feeling today? I'm feeling good. Okay, not sick? No illnesses. No illnesses. Symptoms. Okay, and how was your reaction last time? Um, I had some shoulder discomfort for about uh, 36 hours. Okay. I didn't have any fevers or chills or any fatigue or anything like that. Excellent. So as soon as you get uh, your arm out here, I'm gonna have you fill out some information for me while I get ready here, and then we'll give you your shot, and I'll monitor you for 15 minutes. All right, and this is the Moderna shot, right? Because you've been 28 yep. days, is that right? Yep. I got the Moderna shot as well. Um, you know, we, we get, Adam, you'll know a lot about this. Are we seeing many bad side effects from either the Moderna or Pfizer shots for the second time around? We're not. Um, we're seeing a lot of the common um, achy shoulders, um, you know, some, some people feeling general malaise, that sort of thing, but, but no real bad side effects yeah. that we're Good. seeing. Yeah. And it looks like a pretty normal shoulder. It looks just like mine in my dreams. You know, it, I, I was giving it a pep talk, making sure it's ready to get uh -huh. the vaccine. Yeah. It'll, it'll be a little bit sore. Uh -huh. um, Did you work it, out this morning? No. Okay. No, no. So this is your real shoulder. You know, actually, they do recommend when you do get vaccines, whether it's influenza or Tdap or anything like that, use your dominant hand or your dominant shoulder um, just so you can work it out a little more. I don't know that it matters so much um, with this because I think, uh, you know, some of these side effects, we have just seen kind of more, more people having those local uh, reactions. Now, certainly this year, I did have shoulder discomfort with the influenza vaccine itself, but I yep. think influenza and Tdap, a lot of people seem to get local reaction. Same with the shingles vaccine. I mean, I had, I had the same discomfort as mine, I don't know. Dr. Norman, have you had your shots? I have had <clears throat> the first Moderna, and I will have the second one today. Awesome. awesome. 
I got to put my mask on and, since Adam's standing too close to me. And we'd also like to say, too close, you know, close. we were getting Moderna because we had already gone through our initial Pfizer allocation yeah. um, for those other uh, first line workers who were kind of more prioritized. So, perfect. Yep. You also get a sticker today that says, I got right. my COVID 19 vaccine. Nice. Yay. Go show the world, brother. So, you said you're, you're getting yours today, Dr. Norman? Yes, I am. This morning, later on. Awesome. All right. So, when do we all get to go back to the bars? <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Not Super Bowl Sunday? Yeah, that's right. Like last year? Can we all go party down Please. at Power and Light there? Isn't that, is that the plan? Get a shot, go to party. No, uh, just in case you all know, I am joking a bit about people because, no, you can't go out and party until a lot of people are vaccinated and you still got to wear a mask. Yep. Just saying. Okay, three, okay here comes a big moment. Three. And it's going to be important, too, again, even after this second dose and two weeks from now when my immunity is at optimal or maximal. Uh, we need to continue to mask, not meet in large groups, uh, distance as much as possible, six feet or more, do all those things that we've continued to do uh, because there is still that potential that even if I do get infected. Hang on, Adam, don't go too far. I got a couple questions for you. Okay. All right. I so can still transmit the, the virus. All right, so second shot, and this is kind of what we do in, the, in, in our vaccination clinics too, right? Yep. This isn't a different deal. You just kind of give the shot and people go on through and get on done with it. Yep, so we give, that, we give the shot um, first or second dose. Um, right now we are doing all of our shots um, through our EPIC system, which is fantastic. So people have that information in their MyChart as they're leaving the clinic and they can schedule their second dose. Yep. Um, and then we monitor them for 15 minutes in an exam room just like you would in your doctor's office. Okay. Yeah. Well, good work. And, and as you say, we're really not seeing terrible side effects. We're, having, we're not having anybody pass out or not having to go over to the emergency room. I mean, it's not, it's not a bad thing, right? Yeah, it's not a bad thing. We've had, uh, you know, individuals, again, that just don't feel well. We do some extra monitoring with them, make sure that they're doing okay. We've got some great partners with our allergy physicians here at the University of Kansas Health System that um, are willing to see individuals, talk to individuals if they have concerns, if they have allergies, and talk through um, the safety of the vaccine and, and what setting is right for getting the vaccine. But for the majority of our folks, um, they've done really well with it, okay. well, myself good, included. So, yes. All right. Well, thank you. And you've said you've had it too? Yes, I had, my, I, had my, I had Moderna, my first okay. shot, and I get my second shot on Friday. So, All right. Yes. My next one is on Monday, I believe. Yeah. And so uh, that'll be fun. We're back at it. Well, Adam gave uh, Hawkeye his first shot. He's been invited for the second one and has done it. So I guess that's a good thing. And it didn't hurt? Yeah. Awesome. Did it well. Um, and you said we used the same needle both times, right, Adam? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Different I, needle this time. One, yeah. one more point I'd like to make, too. You know, um, more and more people are getting the monoclonal antibody therapy. Yeah. And right now the recommendation from the CDC is that if you do get the monoclonal antibody, you want to wait 90 days before either you get your first dose or your second dose of vaccine. And that is mostly because there is not a lot of uh, efficacy and safety studies. And we just want to make sure that you get maximal effect from the vaccine. So. All right. Well, thank you. That's a great thing. We are excited that you've been able to do that. And now we're going to pour it. I'm going to have to sit here and watch this for the next 15 yes. minutes until we make sure that make sure that Hawkeye is okay. So, Dr. Norman, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Good morning to you guys. Good. So how's it going across the state of Kansas? How do you feel about vaccine distribution? Well, I've got a lot to talk about today, but I'll be uh, brief enough to get to some questions later. Uh, we're, I think there's a lot of uh, reason for some optimism throughout the state, much like what you talked about, Dr. Stites and Hawkinson, the numbers statewide are improving rather dramatically. Uh, just some numbers. Yesterday, uh, we, uh, since Friday, so three days, recorded 2,602 uh, new cases. Uh, keep in mind that uh, even four, five, six weeks ago, those would have been more like six or 7,000. So we're seeing a, a significant uh, reduction in the number of new cases in three days only, tw and I don't mean only to diminish, there's anybody that dies of uh, COVID-19, it's a, it's a sad day, but there's only 24 cases, and that would have been triple digit even just a few weeks ago. That, uh, I checked the White House report this morning, um, and it reflects what uh, the, their data set is reporting. Uh, new cases for the state of Kansas dropped 24% in the last week. Uh, the positive test results dropped by a third. 
uh, and that's on fairly stable testing numbers, I might add, and deaths uh, reduced by 73%. So um, we're not seeing a big uptick now following the still the, the remnants of the New Year's holidays, uh, and that's a good thing. Great thing. Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> talk about, uh, and by the way, as you know, I deal with, and I'm on the phone with hospitals of all sizes, and we'll begin this afternoon with the smaller hospitals, um, but they're th universally throughout the state are seeing manageable, a wonderful combination of manageable inpatient numbers from COVID-19 and a marked reduction in staff being out due to illnesses, isolation, or quarantine. Uh, so the staff shortages we were seeing statewide have pretty well uh, leveled out are not a big problem. Uh, did, let's talk about the vaccine. Uh, there's one problem with the vaccine, and that is it's too little of it. It's just uh, not enough. Yeah. Right. We're getting um, we're getting into a rhythm and a cadence that uh, that the Fed seem to be helping us um, uh, stabilize it. So for predictability, because uh, like this week we'll push out about 45,000 doses. That's 1% of the total vaccine supply. That's simply per capita numbers. Kansas is 1% of the population and we have 1% of the vaccine. Uh, so that's where that comes from. Uh, and as we, of course, as you know, have entered phase two, uh, which is going to be the largest number of people um, in any particular phase. It's gonna take quite a number of weeks at that level of uh, vaccine distribution from the feds to get through it. We do, we've gotten over a quarter of a million doses distributed to the state of Kansas. Uh, the, the federal database, which lags behind reality, by the way, shows us at six, that 61% of those doses have been uh, administered. I know it's greater than that, but the data is lagging. And by the way, compare that to the United States at large um, with uh, 41 million doses having been distributed, uh, have pushed out, have vaccinated about 54%. So Kansas is out producing the, the nationwide average on that. Um, so the challenge is quite simply are, are, are vaccine sufficient quantities. And as you pointed out, I've, uh, um, it's hard, but we, our, our allocation formula is public. It's on our kansasvaccine.gov website uh, under the provider manual. It uh, spells out very clearly how distribution occurs. There you go. And, uh, and uh, where, where it's going and what the formula is. So the... Uh, Long-term care sites come through the federal pharmacy program, and that's going uh, pretty well. We have 684 uh, long-term care facilities uh, and, and our living arrangements that we consider to be long-term care. Uh, 60, per, 60 to 65 percent of the residents have been in, uh, vaccinated. With uh, most of the rest of them, within the next week or two, will be uh, vaccinated at least with their first vaccine. 40 to 45 percent of the staff have been vaccinated at this point in time, and again, ditto within the next week or two, uh, they should, uh, those are all scheduled for. Um, and by the way, some people are, are not choosing to get the vaccine yet. So I think we're pretty much on, on uh, schedule with that. You saw the uh, earlier, uh, the website, kansasvaccine.gov, we're populating that all the time with more information. Uh, for, you can see there 4.5% of Kansans have been vaccinated at that uh, one on the right there by age group. Um, it'll, it'll become more heavily towards the older uh, patients as time goes on. What you see there is a lot of healthcare persons and a lot of healthcare persons are between 24 and, and 65. Um, and I'm sure they'll get to be more and more 65 and older. By the way, the, the website is updated three times a week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, I did want to comment, uh, Dr. Hawkinson, uh, did think before we went on air, was talking about the various, the variants, uh, yes. the B112 yeah. and the South African, uh, what is it, 1351 yeah. uh, variant. Yeah. We are doing more and more uh, testing and genomic sequencing in the state all the time and uh, and on request. In other words, if, a, if an outbreak acts different than other ones, uh, or if a, a person has had the vaccine, for example, this has happened one time, uh, had, uh, has had the vaccine and gotten COVID-19, I suspect given the timeline, they were incubating it at the time they were uh, immunized. But, uh, but there's one fascinating uh, situation with a uh, correctional facility, a jail actually, where they hadn't had any uh, COVID-19 for weeks. And then uh, a whole 
cluster of cases broke out. Uh, we did the epidemiologic tracking, found out that it came in from the community through the food services workers, the, um, and then it went from there to some other places. So really, but it was very fast spread. And we're going to test every one of those positive individuals we're doing today, I think, with genomic sequencing to see. There's two take home messages there. One is if a, an outbreak acts different than what we've been seeing, we'll do the genomic sequence, uh, so just request it, uh, of us. And then secondly, it's another great example of why correctional facilities uh, are congregate settings that need to be immunized because uh, it was brought into the correctional facility and then taken back out into the community. So the jail is not an island. Uh, finally, testing is going great. Uh, as you, I think I've mentioned a number of times, we've got increased CARES Act funding in mid-December. We've surpassed 2 million uh, tests uh, in over a million individuals uh, and that CARES Act funding has been put to very good use. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased with that. A lot of it did uh, doing more testing in the schools, K through 12. We have 36 school districts that were um, doing various kinds of testing, whether it's for athletics or for students that are coming back after a 10 day incubation period. Uh, uh, and certainly anybody that's symptomatic, we want to have be tested same day with same day results. So with that, Dr. Stites and Dr. Hawkinson, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, and that's, you know, it sounds like good news overall for sure, and I know we've given out the majority of our vaccine. I don't know, we're well over 60%, I think we're closer to 80, and I think about 72% of our employees have had the vaccine, so our vaccine-hesitant numbers are dropping as people have gotten more confidence, and we constantly talk every day about this is safe, our people are doing well, we appreciate, you know, like Adam Meyer coming and saying, look, we're just not seeing these problems yeah. in the follow-up. Kim Dixon was here yesterday with the same message, so I think we're trying to send the message of vaccine vaccine safety. Lee, as you look down the road, where will people be getting vaccinations from health departments, pharmacies, hospitals? Where, where, where is the vaccine going to go for distribution into arms? Um, great question. Um, and by the way, that reminds me to mention that I, I, we had originally tried to get it on the website today, but it'll probably be tomorrow uh, that we'll post a map that has the vaccination locations throughout the state of Kansas. Uh, for the most part, as you know, phase one included healthcare and long-term care. So those were pretty self-explanatory. Phase two, it's gonna be more of a wide open. We're uh, sending out a uh, vaccine to every local health department. Um, we have sent out, of course, a lot to the federally qualified health uh, clinics. And more and more, we're getting uh, re registrations up and running from doctor's offices. And uh, another real game changer will be community pharmacies. Yes, CVS and Walgreens have been a pharmacy partner for long-term care. They will also be pharmacy partners for community vaccinations, uh, but uh, other kinds of settings as well. Uh, as well. The United um, Methodist Ministries uh, is working with us to have a Methodist clinic, uh, Methodist clinics, there you go, Methodist churches serve as vaccination clinics. What will really be exciting is if and when the feds uh, have a, a bigger supply line whether it's through an AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson or whatever the next vaccine might be. Because if we get more vaccine coming in, we can do the mass uh, vaccination clinics. Some of those are going on now. You've done it at KU. Uh, Stormont has done it. And a variety, uh, I know in Wyandotte there's been some. When I talk about mass vaccination clinics, I'm talking about maybe 1,500 or 2,000 or, or more in a single day. We would love to be doing that. But as you can imagine, spreading 45,000 doses a week out at, to 105 counties is a challenge. One thing I think is really important, and one of the things we're seeing as a tr as a uh, indicator of success, when a, a community or a county, when the the various uh, players work together real well, in in other words, uh, when a health department working with FQHC, doctors' offices, and hospital coordinate their efforts, it really helps to select the uh, people that are uh, the most vulnerable in phase two and, and get the vaccine to them first. No, at least here in Wyandotte and, and, and Johnson, what we've tried to do is say, okay, we'll do the 65 and year old patients. Y'all are getting into the essential workers who are still at risk and some of the others that are left over from phase one and our patients who don't have access to health systems as easily. And that way we're all doing something and trying to give vaccine to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Is that consistent with what you're thinking, Dr. Norman? Yeah, very much so, Steve. The, uh, there's an, uh, that strategy, of course, of people coming to fixed sites for a vaccine. Um, and also one of the things that I think is we're seeing um, a good movement towards, and we have um, vehicles uh, in every uh, region of the state and at the state is for mobile clinics. And 
I think it's really important to have great relationships with communities that maybe don't, that are maybe a little bit vaccine hesitant or uh, are, don't have uh, access to transportation as much to bring the vaccinations to them, to their community centers, um, uh, churches and the like. So I think uh, there's been a lot of demonstrated creativity throughout the state um, about how uh, both to attract people in a pull strategy and how to push vaccine out a push strategy. And nothing like local coordination of those, because you all know your communities and your counties uh, better than anything at the state level, I assure you. You bet. And as you know, we stand ready to help anywhere you need us and throughout Kansas. It doesn't matter if it's in Kansas City or in the far northeast or southwestern corners, wherever you want us, we're going to go. So uh, let us know what we can do to help. Let's see what questions we have from reporters, Jill. Good morning. Cody Holyoke with KMBC hey, Cody. News. Hey, Cody. Uh, a couple questions for Dr. Norman. Uh, Doctor, you mentioned a correctional facility. Uh, which one is that? Is that an active investigation? Um, and then secondly, uh, are you hoping for more? Obviously, you're hoping for more doses from the federal government, but realistically, is that going to happen anytime soon? Uh, number one, uh, it will be posting it soon anyway. Uh, it's the Winfield Correctional Facility. And uh, because of the number of cases, it'll be posted on our website as uh, probably tomorrow as a, as a recent outbreak. Uh, and by the way, they're doing a great job of handling it. And it was the thing that sent off the alarm, of course, was the rapidity of the spread, which is back to the, the UK variant or the South African variant, one of the things that, bothered, that worried us. Uh, number two, I don't have any reason for optimism that there's gonna be any uptick in the number of doses. Um, so uh, I wish I could be more up, upbeat than that about it. One of the things that we didn't talk about, and it may sound trivial, but it's not, and that is, and uh, Dana, Dr. Hawkinson, you might want to comment on this. The Pfizer uh, has vials that are five doses. If you use this one kind of syringe, you get six doses out of it. And if you use this other syringe, you get five doses out of it. So to get one extra dose out of a five dose vial, it's a pretty big deal when you're talking about vaccine shortage. That's a 20% uh, so increase in supply. To, yeah. We right, like exactly. that, Hawkeye. So we do. Yeah. Uh, and, and, it, we, and Madam, you probably know about this too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just thinking about the whole syringe thing, how are y'all doing it down in the vaccine clinic? Yeah, so <clears throat> we- Back on camera. Go you got to do your yep. check anyway. Yep, yep, there you go. And I need to know if Dr. Yep. Norman has a heart out today. We didn't talk about that. We have 30-some right. questions from the community. All right, hang on. Let's yeah. just get this guy's question. We'll yeah. come back to Lee. So we, so we um, are consistently seeing six doses that we're getting out of our Moderna vials. Um, we, again, are- um, You said Moderna, you mean Pfizer, I think. Or Pfizer, sorry. Excuse me, Pfizer. Um, out of the Pfizer vials, you know, and, and that is that is doing the recommended poll on those. You know, we're not cutting, making any shortcuts. Those are those are actual doses that we're getting out of those out of the Pfizer vials. So, okay, I think the key to that too is to understand. You know, um, I don't know how the contracts were signed with Pfizer in the United States. Uh, is it based on doses? So if it's based on doses, are the uh, is there going to be a holdback of some of those vials because they are expecting you to get one or two extra doses out of those vials? So, um, you know that that's the other thing to consider. We were able to get some, just as Adam said, from those first allocation of Pfizer. We just hope that, uh, so we were able to vaccinate more people with those. Hopefully when the, uh, the other doses are coming in now, we are co continuing to be able to uh, vaccinate as many people as needed with those Pfizer doses as well, that we can get the same amount from these new allocations. All right. Yeah, and we're at 15 we're minutes. At 15 Let's minutes. Do it, how, are, how are you yeah, feeling? I'm good. I'm good. I feel good. good. No, no, not feeling warm, flush, anything like no. that? Mm -mm, okay, no. good. I haven't you, passed out. Have you gotten smarter? Good. That's good. Uh, I hope so. I feel like it. Good. I feel like it. I good. think just having Lee on has made me smarter. Us all smarter. That's so. all right. One thing that we tell everybody is keep yourself hydrated today, okay. eat well, get plenty of rest, take care of yourself, and continue to wear your mask and socially distance and practice good hand hygiene. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. I don't know who we'll see next Monday, if it's you or one of our on two or someone, but thanks for being here. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Norman, how much time do we have today with you? I can stay till 8.40. 840. All right. Awesome. Yeah. That's how long I can stay. So let's see what your question comment, I'm going to comment something Dana said. Please. That is, uh, we are getting the same number of vials. So we'll eventually in a week or two uh, report an uptick in the number of doses we've received because the feds are going to start reporting it as the number of doses as if there's six per vial. But they're not going to cut down on the number of vials, we are assured. 
That is that is very yeah. good news. And I think we ought to be hearing about the Johnson and Johnson trial not too lot far out either, right? I mean, isn't that supposed to be the end of January, first of February? They report their data. The thought that they, if it's positive, they'd be out there in the market by the end of February. That's what we're hearing. Yeah, so let's hope that that's positive, because that would be good news. If it's negative, it's going to be a setback. So, mm -hmm. all right. Um, so, Jill, other questions or other reporters? I do have a reporter question. It's from Carolina Cruz with Channel 5, and she says she saw a report where the CDC said 41.4 million doses have been handed out to the states. Only 21.8 million have been administered. Yeah. She goes, are the doses unaccounted for? What is happening there? She also wonders, how is the whole ordering process done? Who orders it? Who's, does it go directly from the manufacturer, from the hospital? How's the ordering done? Well, we, let's take on that first part of the question because we know that the data lags behind the number of arms that have been vaccinated because, frankly, it's hard to put all the data in, in, into the registries. Right. Well, let's start with the basics. We don't want to waste any vaccine. Um, and I, the CDC is asking the same question. As a matter of fact, I'll be on a call with Rochelle Walensky, the new CDC director, on Friday to talk about exactly this. Um, the, the, it's, I really think it more than anything, one, there uh, are a few doses being held back by some of the vaccinating sites because they finished phase one. They didn't feel the need to redistribute in their county or their community. And now they're going to go into arms uh, in phase two. So I think there's a little bit of that, but mostly it's this data lag. Uh, you know, we've, we've stressed all along, you know, don't take half the time doing the data entry after into WebIZ, which is our state mandated system. And by the way, it's in many different states. Um, but then, then batch it and put it in there. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot of that. And by the way, you're exactly right on those numbers. I looked at them today as well and uh, that's from the COVID data tracker uh, at the CDC uh, spot on with those numbers so that's 50 by in the U.S. that's where I came up with that number of 54 percent are shown uh, in the data systems to have been administered I'm sure it's much more than that in Kansas we're at 61 percent. Yeah, and I would just say, and Adam, I don't know how where we are on our data entry, but I, when I talk to other chief medical officers or places, they're all complaining it's about the same thing. Mm -hmm. it, take, it takes them a long time to get caught up on the data entry, but the shots are in arms. And I think we've got to be careful in our decision-making because we're going to indict one part of the problem, but it's not really a problem. I think people are getting this. I think the vaccine is getting out there and getting yeah. into arms. I don't know if you any comments, Adam, about that. Because from our standpoint with y'all, when you guys are doing the data entry in the clinic, how, what's the lag like now? I know it's yeah. longer at the yeah. beginning. But. Yeah, so in the very beginning, we were seeing a little bit of a data lag. One of the things, though, that we're really proud of here is our use of Epic. And so Epic has some, some functionality to report directly into WebIZ. And so, um, again, using Epic both for our health system employees as well as now that we've started to um, do some of the community vaccines, we... Um, are finding that that reporting is much quicker because that bi-directional interface with Epic. So yeah. it's really putting technology to work for us, which, which has is been a, great. Which is a great thing. But I know early on it was just hard. So I would just say we've got to make sure we talk about the right problem uh, as opposed to the wrong problem. So then the second question, Lee, I think is Rye, is a good one. How, what's the ordering process like? Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me comment one more on that first question, and then I'll move on to Please. number two. Uh, a couple things. One is that we're recruiting a lot of vaccinating sites and vaccinators who are not normally doing uh, vaccines as a routine part of their uh, community uh, practice, if you will. So we're having to do a lot of training on WebIZ, a few people stub their toes. But believe it or not, there's a lot of communities, particularly out in western Kansas, that have very poor access to uh, high-speed internet and bandwidth, literally bandwidth, is a problem for some of these smaller communities. So it's a it's a beast that we're just going to have to tackle. I think we're going to see this continuously throughout this whole uh, marathon that we're in with the data management. I think it'll lag consistently. But as you say, Steve, we got to get it into arms. Okay, ordering. Um, um, and this, by the way, is in the provider manual on our KansasVaccine.gov website uh, on slide number 13, as a matter of fact. Um, it will tell you that on Tuesday, the, the uh, Operation Warp Speed tells us how many doses we're going to get. On Tuesday night, we put out a query to all the vaccinating sites and say how many vaccines do you need or you want. Um, and Thursday night, we uh, submit that order to Operation Warp Speed. 
and uh, then that starts a series of motions so that from one day to five days later, the vaccine will be received at the vaccinating sites. Usually that's on Monday or Tuesday of the following week. So that's just the cadence and the rhythm that we go through. Um, and it's working. It's not enough vaccine, did I mention that? Uh, but it's the ordering process is working. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. I bet we're going to find at some point when we look back in this crisis that when we thought 50 or 60 percent of vaccine was already in arms, I bet it's closer to 80 percent. I, I bet a lot <clears throat> most of the vaccine is in arms. Jill, next question. All right, we have a couple of people, including Lynn, that are in their 70s. One is on the Missouri side, one's on the Kansas side. They're frustrated that they can't get the vaccine yet and they don't fit in a phase. They want to know why 20-somethings that work maybe in a grocery store are ahead of them. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. We can certainly answer it. But the basic answer to this question is there's simply not enough vaccine. Yep. Just as an example, we have about 120,000, 130,000 patients over the age of 65 mm -hmm. at KU that are on, that we've seen in the last three years, right? And, you know, we've had... How many patients have we given it to? 3,000, some of the 2,000. I mean, not many. And so, um, and that was just vaccine leftover from the vaccine hesitant. And, and, and so we didn't want it sitting on the shelf. So we went ahead and started giving it to some arms. And we gave a bunch of the county, both Wyandotte and Johnson County, so they could finish up essential workers, et cetera. But I'll tell you, vaccine's not sitting on the shelf. Okay, Lee, I think it makes sense. We've got to vaccinate those frontline workers to keep us all safe. And some of those times that's in hospital, sometimes it may be your police and fire department, and sometimes it may be a grocery store because they're part of the essential food chain. Right. Um, you know, the phase, and by the way, in response to the uh, woman who wrote a good question, uh, I can't speak for the Missouri side, but in the Kansas side, you're in phase two and are eligible for the vaccine now. So it, depending on what county you live in, uh, make contact with your local health department. If they have a registration site, go ahead and register. Doesn't mean you're going to get the vaccine until, until there's more vaccine coming into the state but you are eligible in the state of Kansas in phase two. To your point, uh, Dr. Stites, yes. Uh, you know, uh, in, in that same um, uh, prioritization manual that we have on the website, which by the way, it shows each, it shows the rationale. Why, why do we even have these uh, priorities uh, and prioritization schedule? And some people can control their environment and some can't. And people that are frontline workers, whether they're police or grocery store clerks or the like, they can't, uh, manage who comes in, who comes out. They can't isolate and stay away from folks. So there's a the, the CDC and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and even Department of Homeland Security helped us to come up with the prioritization. And it's controversial. There's no question about it. Uh, and uh, I, I get lots of uh, calls and letters and emails from people that think that uh, that their special circumstances isn't their needs aren't being met. Uh, so it's it's. Uh, it's kind of polarizing, and uh, and yet it's based in evidence. Uh, it's not just pulling uh, prior uh, preferences out of the air. I hope people believe that. Yeah, I think, well, I think the other thing just to say in Hawkeye, this is I think it's important for it. If you're an essential worker, as you said, Lee, you can't control your environment. Anybody can come in front of you. But if you're not, you can practice good infection control and stay home and do the things that shelter in place that keep you safe. And that's the key thing. If you're in a place where you can stay safe, mm -hmm. that gives you an advantage over the police or the firemen or the garbage folks or the, or the environmental service workers, the dietitians or the, the people yeah. who work inside hospitals, mm -hmm. the essential workers at grocery stores and teachers. You know, it's hard to stay yep. safe in those environments. Yeah, I mean, the demand is so high right now. And it's demand in different populations. And whether that's a 20-something who's, uh, you know, working in our supply chain so that we can get goods and services that we need, you know, food, grocery stores, whether it's the teachers in the schools, counselors, administrators there that are uh, helping take care of our children so our children can get back to school, any of that uh, is very important. So the demand is very high, but it is also those other populations that are older and have comorbidities. Um, we just need more supply. And once that happens, uh, and it is rolling out, I think certainly right now it's better than it was two weeks ago, and I think two weeks from now it's going to be even better. So. Uh, Try to con continue to control your environment. There is uh, a light on the horizon. You should hopefully be able to get it soon. We are hearing more updated uh, dates now in, in, the, in the national media about when things will be available. You know, Dr. Norman has been talking about when they'll be available here locally in Kansas, uh, and it will happen. Yeah, I remember every time we haven't had enough supply, whether it was handy wipes or toilet paper, yeah. everybody got a little frustrated. And now the problem is we don't have enough vaccine. 
vaccine it. Vaccine is a coming. You know, it's interesting, though. There's this whole group of vaccine deniers or hesitant, and then these vaccine desperate. And, you know, it's just <laughs> it's just constant conflict. You can't you can't make them all happy. We have several people that are taking antibiotics. Camille is uh, supposed to get her shot today, and she's on an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Is there any concern? What do you think, Hawk? I would say no. The short answer to that is no. If you're on an antibiotic, it's most likely for a um, bacterial infection. Um, but even any antivirals that you may be on are not going to affect coronavirus. We've obviously seen that because we don't have very good viral therapeutics right now for that. So uh, you can go ahead and get your, your vaccination. Susan wants to know if, uh, from Dr. Norman if there is a state policy or procedure for receiving the second dose. Her story is she went to Johnson County Health Department. She got her vaccine at the Arts and Heritage Center when she asked, do I come back here to get it? And they go, don't know. You're going to have to figure that out on your own and find it. That's not a typical answer, Lee. Yeah. Uh, that's usually the, I would expect that the people would go back to the same location and get their vaccine. Uh, uh, because uh, again, we don't hold back uh, vaccine doses or vials specifically for that person, but our ordering includes prime doses and second and uh, booster doses. So uh, I would just uh, recommend that she continue to go back to the same location uh, and uh, and just get scheduled for it because it, yeah, uh, it will come. It will come. That's how it's allocated. Yeah, and I know that's not how we're doing that. When you yeah, get your exactly. first dose here, we schedule you for the next dose. Is that right, Adam? You're going to get the schedule yeah. at the same time. And that's one of the glories of being in the health system and being in Epic and being able to get this stuff. We're pretty well organized around it. In some places, perhaps that's a bigger challenge when you don't have that easy database that's accessible. But, but nevertheless, I would expect that when you get your first dose, you should be able to get your second dose at the same spot. I mean, that's been part of the plan, Lee, we I think, the whole time. That. Yeah, even we were doing that here locally. You know, we had moved our vaccine places to two or three different places. But if you got your first vaccine dose in one place, you were going back to that second place, even though the rest of the vaccine clinic had moved. Yeah, so. we've kept it going. So people are, they can't, there's never an excuse to say, I don't know where I'm going to yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. All right, three minutes, Dr. Norman. Joanne wants to know, do you get all the vaccine that you order? Yes. Next question. Yes, because you get it allocated. It's strictly off population, right? I mean, you, we can say, gosh, how much do you order? But the reality is you're going to get 1% of the shipment because Kansas is 1% of the population. Yeah, we there was a little sorting out early on, uh, let's say, middle of December. Um, and uh, But I think we are kind of in a cadence that's pretty dependable. One of the things that's driven the vaccinating sites a little crazy is, one, not knowing when it's going to arrive, and the second, not knowing the number of doses. Because you can imagine it's hard to run a... Uh, vaccination clinic if you don't know if you're going to have uh, 100 doses or 1,000 doses. Um, but we're trying to be predictable. Even if it's not enough, we will at least want to be predictable so that all the vaccinating sites can have a very, very formulaic and, and very dependable. So back to the earlier question from the lady, uh, so that you can be sure of getting dose number two. By the way, if there's snowbirds that are down in uh, Arizona or Florida and get dose number one, they come back to Kansas, their home, we want to vaccinate those people um, so they can go through the same mechanisms to locate a vaccinating site for dose number two. We don't hold it against so that they had a, the first dose out of state. Chris wants to know, is Kansas still last in our country for vaccine distribution? Where are we listed now? Oh, we're a lot better, Lee. I, mean, I don't think we were ever really last. Again, it was a reporting issue. Right. Yeah, the, the, the WebIZ data feed didn't go to uh wasn't picked up by the cdc so we appeared on that but we fixed that immediately last week we were uh in the top tier of the facilities this week we've slipped a little bit in the doses per capita um, but we're giving everything we have so i mean we're we're going to have a hard time if other more metropolitan states get a disproportionately higher amount and vaccinate more we'll we'll have a hard time staying in the top tier but we're up in the um upper uh, certainly up in the upper third uh, on the doses per capita. So it's doing the best we can with the allocations we have. Julie wants to know, public school educators qualify for vaccine, but what about those that work in higher education? All right, so what about, yeah, undergraduate education? Yeah, higher ed, um, this has been a source of some unpopularity for Lee Norman, um, is that in higher ed, we haven't, uh, uh, have, we don't have those folks in the second uh, phase. The reason being, of course, when you go back to the prioritization, one, they're not likely to get ill. They've never been likely to get ill and die from it. Second, they can control their environment. Third, there's space and it can be available. Fourth, they can do virtual, uh, unlike K through 12, 
is much more likely to be able to do virtual classes. As much as we would like to have uh, uh, higher ed in phase two, who do I want? Who do we want to bump out of phase two? Uh, the elderly uh, or people in congregate settings? I mean, it's it's a matter of if you vaccinate that person, then this person doesn't get a vaccine. So who is the highest risk? It's all based on evidence and risk. We've been able to show yeah, to you with a faculty uh, a hawk last year that we really didn't see spread inside the faculty, despite no, that they, in fact right. they were educating. And the students did well, unless they were going to be in congregate living and partying a little too much, perhaps without masks and perhaps with alcohol. Okay, Dr. Norman, mm -hmm. um, people are asking, why are cancer treatment patients not in the earlier phases? Even former cancer patients are feeling vulnerable. The uh, again, coming out of the CDC uh, and the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, having had cancer treatment uh, was not considered to be, or had having had cancer was not evidence-based proof that it put them at higher risk. Now, a lot of those people are gonna be 65 and older and already into phase two or have other reasons to be in phase two, uh, but uh, merely having had cancer alone does not put people uh, into a remarkably higher uh, risk of those other things I mentioned, which is contracting the disease and having a bad outcome. So it's just based on evidence and risk, and we follow the CDC guidelines on this. And Hawkeye, there's pretty good evidence out there that diabetes, obesity, yeah. um, advanced yeah. lung disease, advanced heart disease are bigger risk factors yeah. than he, uh, cancer. And so we will say we've got cancer right, but there's a lot of bad diseases out there, mm -hmm. and that can cause problems for folks. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And there's a lot of cancer diagnosed. You know, skin cancer is a little bit different. So all those things are a little bit different. But just as Dr. Norman said, you know, recovery from cancer or having had cancer in the past, just as he mentioned with ACIP, the advisory committee, and immunization practice didn't show that there was definitive proof that they're at higher risk but a lot of people who've had cancer are also in that age group above so I think they also may have some of the other associated medical problems yeah. that will push their risk yeah. a little bit and and you know that's one of the hard problems that people start saying well what about my risk factors yeah the, the problem is the risk factors are all grid, grades of it so I've had prostate cancer but yeah I don't, you know, it's pretty mild and stuff like am I at risk probably not so I think in that situation you just you, know, you just have to be thoughtful and reasonable around it okay last question for Dr. Norman last question well, you're two minutes over but I'm going to ask it anyway Dr. Norman Kansas gets vaccinated based on population. Suzanne wants to know, why does Johnson County have such a low percentage based on the population? Johnson County is allocated on a per capita basis. Uh, so it's, uh, what is, you know, 6,500 doses this week out of 45,000 uh, is there, that's the portion. Uh, what, the five biggest counties obviously get the uh, uh, big allocations compared to the smaller counties. Uh, but it's, uh, it's based on per capita basis. All right. Well, Dr. Norman, I want to say, first of all, I want to say thank you for your public service. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Norman is also a decorated military uh, a veteran. And are you a colonel or something? What's your official rank now? Yeah, I'm a colonel in the Army. So I actually have to be nice to the guy most of the time. Right. Not not all the time, though. But I You're want not to very say, good at it. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for your service. Thanks for being on our program this morning. We look forward to having you back next week. It's, it's always a delight. Final thoughts today, Dr. Norman? No, just uh, keep taking care of yourself and do the anti-contagion measures of masks and hand washing and distancing and the like. This is not a time to, lose, to drop your guard uh, because we're definitely uh, on the improving side. Let's keep that trend going. Yep, and I think the hospitals are going to be so much better off as the nursing homes are vaccinated, over 65 get vaccinated, the pressure will come off and things will begin to feel a little bit better then. So that we, we really look, we really have that to look forward to. Hey, before we go to too many other concluding thoughts, I want to remind everybody that tomorrow, Senator, um, U.S. Senator from Kansas, Jerry Moran, joins our update from Washington, D.C., and Dr. Jessica Callender Rich, who's a national member of the Coronavirus Commission for the Safety and Quality in Nursing Homes, and one of our fine general medicine docs and geriatricians, is going to be back to answer questions about seniors and those over 65 getting the vaccine. That'll be a hoot. Hawkeye, final thoughts today. Yeah, you know, um, we're seeing comments about all these variants. Uh, the vaccines do look to continue to have an effect and efficacy right now. Uh, continue to do that, but just as Dr. Norman said, 
continue those non-pharmaceutical interventions, and that's masking, distancing, not meeting in large groups, especially as we, again, we come into these next two weeks with the Super Bowl. Be very vigilant and mindful of that. Uh, there was some statement by Dr. Fauci that said, you know, maybe wearing two masks is, is, is reasonable and certainly could be efficacious. We can understand how that could be. One mask can provide protection. Two can certainly help filter out more. Uh, we need to make sure, and I think our culture has gotten better here, um, that everybody's wearing one mask because there was a huge divisiveness about even doing that. So start with one mask. If you can wear two and tolerate that, that's fine too. But continue to do these non-pharmaceutical interventions until this demand for the vaccine gets less because we have more supply and are able to get it into more arms. And Hawk, I just want to say uh, I'm glad you're still upright and doing Feeling well good. and having yeah. that second vaccine. That's outstanding. So again, a special thanks to you for doing that on the program, to Dr. Norman for being on our program. And remember this, we have a lot of patients, but we may not have a lot of patients. So there's still a lot of folks out here that have COVID. We still have a lot of patients and we can make a difference with that. And the difference we know how to do is the same one we've been talking all along. We don't have much patience before we get a vaccine. But the truth is we've already been to that this almost a year and it seems like a long time, but that light at the end of the tunnel, it's getting brighter, it's getting closer and it's gonna be here before you know it. And in the meantime, just as we prove every single day on our COVID units, you can stay safe by following the rules of infection control. Wash your hands, keep your distance, don't go out if you're sick, cough or sneeze into your elbow, and wear a mask. What once was a politically divisive statement in a move that often mystified those of us in the healthcare profession because we've been wearing masks for decades and generations. We know that masks are not a political statement. Masks or a statement of health. And it says, I care about you. So let's care about each other. Wear your mask, keep your distance, follow the rules. And as the light comes closer and we all get the happy vaccinated and there are new therapies available, we'll be back at our head, we'll be back at the K and we'll get back to a little closer to normal. But in the meantime, remember, there's still no place like home. We'll see you tomorrow.